So clearly The Last of Us 2 is a game that has been causing many takes from both the gaming journalist side and content creator camps. This isn't a specific video about why The Last of Us 2 is good or bad, even though that will be included, but more so about the review bombing practice that exists and why it continues thanks to journalistic practices that need to end. This also isn't going to be a politically charged video. So I'm not going to talk about my beliefs or my positions to try and bolster any kind of decision that was made. Huge spoiler warning for anyone watching, so if you do not want even the slightest thing to be spoiled, please exit this video. I'll be talking about a few different sections. Perfect scores and scoring systems, gamers being bigots, misogynists, etc., the problems the majority has with The Last of Us 2, and shielding games from criticism and why review bombs happen. If you're new to the channel, feel free to subscribe for streams, reviews, and other gaming content. With that being said, let's go ahead and talk about review bombs, why they happen, and why condemning the reaction and not actually addressing the cause does more harm than it does help. To start off, I want to talk about review scores for games and why I've thought they aren't a great system in the first place and why I've only become more staunch in that stance. From the very moment I was old enough to wrap my head around subjective opinions and game reviews, I never understood the scoring systems and how you could put value on a subjective opinion as it pertains to games. If you haven't seen it, Alana Pierce has a really good video explaining the inner workings of review scores. In saying that, it still doesn't change the fact that the 1 to 10 ranking systems are just bad. Right from the beginning when she is explaining that a 10 out of 10 review for IGN does not mean that a game is perfect, it shows my reasoning. Webster's definition of perfect is brought to consummation or completeness, completed, not defective nor redundant, having all the properties of qualities requisite to its nature and kind, without flaw, fault, or blemish, without error, mature, whole, pure, sound, right, correct. To me, not being able to get a higher score would in fact mean that something is perfect. 10 points out of 10 possible points is without flaw, fault, or blemish. A little later in the video, she talks about how a 5 out of 10 does not mean a game is average, it actually means it's mediocre. Yet again, we're sitting here with 5 being the average score on a scale of 1 to 10, but it does not mean that in their score system. Instead, a 7 or 8 is more meant to be average for a game. The way those two score systems are used themselves are a pretty heavy argument against a numeric review score system, but you combine that with the fact that it is nearly impossible to put everyone's subjective minds on a parallel level, and you already have created the opportunity for confusion and misunderstanding. A better way to score or review games would be systems you see like buy it, rent it, or skip it, recommend or don't recommend, things like that. Next, we move on to a trope that has been pretty steadily been pushed around for some time. It seems like a very small sect of the gaming community has been picked as a representation of it as a whole. Angry gamers and other terms like it seem to pop up when we see a game receiving any kind of backlash, especially in the AAA game territory. We've seen it when the Epic Game Store decided to start buying up exclusive rights to games and consumers were justifiably upset about this. Consumers let this be known and were immediately met with the typical angry gamer brand for being forced into using a severely subpar launcher to play titles that they might have pre-ordered on Steam or were looking forward to playing. With The Last of Us 2, we've already seen this coming at full force as well. The Last of Us 2 is a game that features multiple LGBTQ characters, and many of them in prominent roles, which is great. There were leaks in I believe April that showed a lot of plot points and narrative points that many of the fans of the franchise and those that were looking forward to the game did not like. These leaks, along with prominent LGBTQ characters and narrative outrage that was caused by the leaks, all combined to create a perfect storm for the angry gamer trope to come back in full force. I will absolutely admit that there is a very, very, very small sect of gamers that wrote this game off as soon as they caught any whiff of gay, bi, or trans inclusion, and I don't agree with them at all. But the overwhelming majority of fans of the franchise are not upset for those reasons. When you look at the reviews for The Last of Us Remastered, it is still standing at a 9.1 because it was a game with absolute incredible storytelling, character development, and even the pacing was great. There was a character named Bill in that installation who has a partner Frank, and this is clearly shown in-game. 
Bill is not only a character that is well written, but he also survives, which breaks a recurring trend with LGBTQ characters. And there it is, The Last of Us still standing at 9.1. Even the DLC that followed, which centered around Ellie and her relationship with her friend Riley, and a subsequent kiss between the two of them, still sits at an 8.1 for the PS3 version, even with a few The Last of Us 2 review bombs in there. But what you'll see with this DLC's review scores is, over and over, people cite how it only took them 2 hours to complete and cost them $15 to play, and that was their problem. You of course find one or two reviews talking about SJWs, but again, a very, very, very small sect of the reviews. Good stories generate good reviews, which both of these games did. As I said in the previous section, the review bombing of The Last of Us 2 isn't about the LGBTQ inclusivity. There are major story and character issues that distance the game from its predecessor that has rubbed passionate fans of the series the wrong way. I again want to remind you that if you don't want any sort of story stuff to be ruined, stop watching the video. A very significant portion of the negative reviews you see and read will pertain to the death of Joel. Is it the death of Joel itself? Maybe for some, but again a small sect. The majority of The Last of Us fans saw the writing on the wall. He was never going to survive this game. It was not the fact that Joel died, it was the way he died. The way he found himself in the situation where he died. A man who trusts no one and survived an apocalyptic world because of it, suddenly abandoned that for a stranger he would be skeptical with at best. Now, the way he was tortured and executed is another gambit that I'll get back to later. You combine this with the bait and switch they pulled in a scene, and I'm paraphrasing, where Jesse comes behind Ellie, grabbing her before she spins around and she sees him, and asks him, what are you doing here? Jesse then says, you don't think I'd let you do this alone, do you? Back in an earlier trailer for the game, this exact situation happened, but it was Joel who said it. It was Joel who was standing there as the camera focus switched. You can try to frame it however you want, but that is outright deceit. There are people who try to say the story or narrative could have changed within that time of the trailer. First off, that's a terrible excuse. Second, they very easily could have kept the scene with Joel's voice and a vision of him standing there, but it's then revealed that Ellie was just imagining Joel's voice in the vision of him. It was Jesse all along. This could have tied into the mental struggles, guilt, and mental decline she was going through due to her blind quest for revenge. It wasn't the death of Joel. It could also have to do with the early timing, but the main problem is how and why the most beloved character of the franchise met his demise. Speaking of that scene, we come to the next problem. Abby. Right from the start, before you even dive into her character and start to dissect it, the fact that you play a significant portion of the game as her instead of Ellie or Joel was never going to be a well-received implementation. But, you add into the fact that they did a poor job of making her even semi-redeemable, and that just feeds the flames. You can absolutely make a character do bad, evil, disgusting things and still make your audience like them. You can make a character that your audience loves to hate. Cersei Lannister and Ramsay Bolton in the Game of Thrones, even though the ending was awful. The Joker and Batman, and if you want to stick directly to video games, there's Sephiroth and Kefka in Final Fantasy, Handsome Jack in Borderlands, Andrew Ryan in Bioshock, and many, many more. Having a brutal antagonist without giving them any kind of depth or interesting draw to them will make it so that their brutality overshadows the entire narrative, or lack thereof, of who they are. But that's also a point that could apply to the entirety of The Last of Us 2. When it comes to empty characters, The Last of Us 2 has plenty of that. Jesse and Dina and Lev are important characters in the game and overall story, but it never feels like you form any kind of serious connection with Jesse or Lev, and Dina feels like she's only there to be the love interest and to lazily throw in some tension because there's somebody that's pregnant during the apocalypse. Opinions may have shifted if we had a better understanding of them, but there are so many things that need to be explained in the game, but there's only so much time that can be spared for each character. Which, this being the case is a bummer, because just like the first Last of Us, in its time, the motion cap, voice acting, graphics, and many other things in The Last of Us 2 are fantastic. When you look at the other characters in this story, do they hold a candle to Sam and Henry and how they were used in the first story? Do they stand up to the same level of Bill and how much you may have disliked him, but couldn't fully despise him and you feel his pain with the events of his partner Frank? 
Or were the other characters in The Last of Us 2 used more so for even more brutal violence to try and evoke emotion? The last of the major points I'm going to make is the excessive violence used throughout the game. It gets to the point where it's basically normalized and expected to where it really has no impact on you once you get so far into the game. There isn't some kind of moral dilemma that you face because whether you like it or not, you're going to watch this person get gutted, beat this person's face in, or even worse, be forced to play as the character who beat an actually beloved character to a pulp. After you become numb to this use of graphic violence, it takes away and dilutes major scenes that actually have understandable reasoning behind it. Harking back to Sam and Henry of the first Last of Us, the way that piece of story hit me in the feels is something I'll never forget in gaming. The way that things were such a roller coaster from start to finish, with Joel not trusting them after they reunite, and then the gut wrenching conclusion of their arc, and where a man surviving an apocalypse couldn't reconcile with the fact that he just had to kill his brother that was lost to the infection and ended his own life in that moment. There was no need for excessive or over-the-top violence, and that arc alone still hit harder than anything I can remember in The Last of Us 2. Now we come to the reasons why review bombs happen. For this section of the video, we're going to take a quick look at Review Tech USA and his video on review bombs, where he subsequently dances around the subject of review bombs. And before you get any kind of ideas, I do enjoy his content. He's a smart guy and really knows his stuff but here he drops the ball and falls for the narrative. This part of the video caught my attention for sure, and I fully agree with that, especially for situations like this. I'm also glad for independent YouTube content creators that also have platforms to give their opinions on those very same games places like IGN get to do early reviews on. He then goes on to lecture gamers about not doing review bombs or things like it as if the majority of gamers are those exact angry gamers that journalists cry wolf about. It's just another un unfortunate round of condemning the reaction without speaking a word on the cause. And that might be because he only played four hours of it, or maybe he agrees with the journalists who think it. But why do review bombs happen? You see things like this happen when a group of people feel like their voice isn't being heard, or when they think it is being ignored. Loot boxes are something that continue to play games and continue to frustrate consumers. Remember Battlefront 2 and the review bombs it got for that? Consumers, content creators, and more were very outspoken about how much they hated loot boxes and EA was public enemy number one for using them. This was well known for years in the public and even in the courtrooms. Regardless, EA refused to listen to the feedback and with nothing else to really turn to, when they felt like they were being ignored, people resorted to review bombing the game. Now, to be fair, they listened after this and turned Battlefront into a pretty solid game as it stands. You have to look deeper than the reaction. You can't condemn the reaction and shield or say nothing about the cause of it. The reaction for The Last of Us 2 was a review bomb. The cause for this is what we need to realize and analyze. Yet again, journalists resorted to identity politics without looking deeper into why the review bombs happened. It's a case of people being offended for a group or a collection of people. I'm black, I've had this happen plenty of times before. I know that there are good intentions a lot of the times when people do this, but this latest stunt is just disingenuous. And when they try to tell you that the reviews are filled with filth, or that you shouldn't dare read them because they are so evil, that's not true either. Even if you're someone like me who would probably be labeled as a progressive, I'm pretty sure we're all tough enough to handle a few SJWs thrown our way. If you actually read the reviews, which I guarantee you most journalists did not, you'll see a lot of passionate fans that are disheartened by a lot of the development in their favorite characters and the disdain for a severely unlikable antagonist. Although bravo to the wonderful Laura Bailey for making the most out of a very flawed character. But using this excuse of LGBTQ hate when it's not the cause does damage to that community and its welcome climb into mainstream media and art. In a game driven by story, when you make bad choices in that story, you're going to have pushback and criticism from your most passionate fans. The reaction was a review bomb because there were significant leaks, followed by disconnected reviews that shielded justified criticism behind a wall of angry gamers who hate the LGBTQ community. Even as I was recording the voiceovers for this, I came across an absolutely terribly toned article that told you to ignore the 
internet hate for The Last of Us 2, literally saying don't listen to the user reviews, just listen to us. Daniel Van Boom writes an article that dips its toes into the actual problems of the game and its stories, but then of course can't resist the need to deflect through the use of LGBTQ hate and turn that small minority into a representation of the majority so you can get a few clickbaity headlines. No, Dan, people were not mad that Ellie, a lesbian, became the protagonist. Yes, Dan, they did use manipulative marketing like I talked about with that Jesse Joel bait and switch. You combine this with the character shifts of Joel and the brutal death by an insanely unlikable antagonist, and that is the problem. It's a shame because there are so many talented people in this game and that worked on this game. Don't get me wrong, The Last of Us 2 is not going to suffer financially by any means whatsoever, and that's not something that I would hope for, especially because of all the talented actors and people who brought to life some of the most stunning graphics we've seen on a console. There are a lot of good things about The Last of Us 2, an improved progression system, outstanding accessibility and difficulty options, and albeit a pretty similar to its predecessor combat system that's solid and keeps you on your toes. The Last of Us 2 is not a game that deserves something like a 3 out of 10 in my eyes, but with a franchise that drew the incredible and deserved praise for its storytelling, I can understand why we're seeing these reviews pop up. Are there some that will hate The Last of Us 2 because there is LGBTQ representation in it? Absolutely, but that is a very, 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 very small sect. Riley McLeod, a transgender man himself, points out something eloquently in his review. He talks about how there is LGBTQ representation in the game, but they're just there. The game doesn't go out of its way to drive home that fact, which he also agrees was the right approach, especially for building more opportunities for major representation and paving the way for more LGBTQ protagonists. This is a debunking of what so many gaming journalists are trying to deflect towards. The angry gamer just hates the game for trying to push an agenda. No, that's not the case. The Last of Us 2 doesn't try to push any kind of LGBTQ agenda or go out of its way to focus on the fact that any of the characters are LGBTQ. People dislike the game because the story, character development, and Season 8 Game of Thrones-esque character shifts are just bad especially coming off of a game that has widespread praise for one of the most gut-wrenching, beautifully written endings in the first installment. And then you have Neil Druckmann who just doesn't help anything at all. The problem is journalists and outlets who shield games, especially AAA games, that just didn't live up to the hype and take any kind of customer dissent as an agenda itself. Review bombing is a thing that started because people did not feel like their feedback or concerns were being listened to, or being taken into consideration. It's just going to be a thing that continues until that changes. Art is and should always be created in the artist's vision, but that shouldn't shield it from criticism. I'm not a person who agrees with review bombing or think it's the most effective route, but I'm surely not going to lecture them when I could address the problem that caused them in the first place. But that's going to be it for this one. If you're new to the channel, you can expect videos like this, live streams, and other gaming content. Feel free to join our Discord at the link in the description below. Let me know what you think about The Last of Us 2, review bombing, and just anything you think I missed in general in the comments below. Subscribe if you haven't already for more gaming content. Have a good night, and I'll see you in the next video.